Good morning. Welcome to Grace Bible Fellowship. We thank you for all tuning in during uh, day 1,297 of the COVID virus. It seems like uh, that long, but I just pray that you guys are doing well, and we're going to bring you the Word of God as this is um, a special day, the Sunday before the resurrection known as Palm Sunday. But if you just pray with me. Father, thank you for this time together. I thank you that we're dependent upon you for so many things and that we can trust you, that you have our best interests at heart. And we're grateful for that. that even the difficult times, that you use them for your glory. And I pray that you help us to see that, that you'd help us to uh, be patient and that you'd help us to continue to hope and look to you. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for your grace and your mercy towards us. Pray that you might help us to be a light in this dark world at this time and help us to look to you. In Jesus' name, amen. So welcome to Palm Sunday, which is the Sunday before uh, Easter or, or before the resurrection. And it's the time when Jesus entered into Jerusalem. We're going to be covering the book of Luke, chapter 19, verse 29 to 47. And you're going to see these three portions of the arrival of the king. The preparation the reception, and the reaction of Jesus to all that happens. So as we go through, you can be looking for those things. We begin in verse 29 of Luke 19. And it came to pass when he drew near Bethpage and Bethany at the mountain called Olivet that he sent two of his disciples saying, go into the village opposite you where you will enter and you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Loose it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why are you loosing it? Thus you shall say to him, because the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went their way, and they found it just as he had said to them. And as they were loosing the colt, the owners of it said to them, Why are you loosing the colt? And they said, The Lord has need of him. And then they brought him to Jesus. And they threw their own clothes on the colt, and they set Jesus on him. And as they went, many spread their clothes on the road, and then as he was now drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works which they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. For he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. Now as he drew near, he saw the city and he wept over it, saying, If you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes, for the day will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you, and close you in on every side, and level you and your children within you to the ground. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. And then he went into the temple and he began to drive out those who bought and sold in it, saying to them, it is written, my house is a house of prayer, but you have made it into a den of thieves. And he was teaching daily in the temple, but the chief priests the scribes and the leaders of the people sought to destroy him. So we're told is the story of the coming of the king, the king of kings, the one who had created everything. And his coming was not like that of a regular king, not like some monarch who you might assume to come in, or if President Trump were to roll through town, you would think that his appearing would be completely different than what Jesus chose and elected to do that day. He didn't come like B.B. King. He wasn't that kind of a king. He wasn't popular because of his music. He was not a religious ruler who came and had tons of followers after him. Uh, he, he didn't want that. He came on the back of a donkey. He wasn't a political ruler, although lots of people looked for him to free Jerusalem from the grip of the Romans at that time. But he didn't come as a political leader. He didn't come as some kind of a popular rock band that was welcomed with screams of adulation. He was someone who came humbly speaking the truth as a sacrifice. He didn't even come as an influential voice of social change. He didn't say everybody should just learn to get along. 
He didn't say that we need to make things equitable and we need to clean things up. He came to be the sacrifice for change. He also was not like a reigning monarch who would come in and rule with an iron hand to tell people what to do and where to go. He did things completely differently. And he certainly wasn't like the king of rock and roll who was looking for praise. He wasn't looking for the adulation of people. He came to present himself for who he was. And so beginning in verse 29, it came to pass that when he drew near to Bethpage and Bethany at the mountain called Olivet, that he sent two of his disciples saying, go into the village opposite you where you will enter. You will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Loose it and bring it here. Well, it's kind of interesting. Jesus tells them to go and get a colt and bring it in. If you look in the book of Matthew, it actually says these two disciples go and they bring a mother and her colt. So we get a little bit more information. And yet he's to ride on a colt that has never been ridden before. Can you imagine being one of the two disciples where Jesus says, go into this town and I want you to find these animals and just untie them and bring them here. Uh, it's not something you would think Jesus would ask you to do. But they go, and they actually do what he asked them to do. And Jesus said, if anyone asks you, why are you loosing it? Thus you shall say to him, because the Lord is need of it. So those who were sent went their way, and they found it just as he said to them. So they go, and they find a cult that's never been ridden since 1977. Uh, it wasn't that kind of cult. But he asked them to pick one, pick take this thing out from those who own it and bring it to him. And I don't know about you, but if Jesus asked me to steal a car, I'd feel a little funny about it. If he asked me to take some possessions of somebody else's, isn't that one of the Ten Commandments not to steal? Whether Jesus prearranged this or it was preordained that he understood how this was going to be, he had a plan and told them exactly how to handle it if anybody questioned them purloining these animals. So why did he choose a cult? I mean, he could have provided any sort of means of transportation to be able to go in. If you look when Solomon was made king, King David, as he knew he was dying, said, I want you to put Solomon on my donkey, and I want you to bring him in and bring him to my throne and put him there and say, long live King Solomon. And in so doing, they installed Solomon as the king after David when he knew that his power was, was fading. And so they installed Solomon in just this way. And I wonder if Jesus wasn't trying to send a message. This is who I am. He's coming in the likeness of a Jewish ruler, not like a worldly ruler. But why a donkey? It just seems the most simple way to come in. And it, certainly not on a giant steed or, or on a flying carpet if he wanted to. He could have come coming in on a cloud and levitating in to display who he was. But he chose a donkey. I think it's interesting because if you look on the back of the donkey, there's this interesting symbol of a cross. And a week from the time that Jesus comes in to ride this donkey, he's crucified on a cross. And I just wonder if this isn't Jesus um, looking and remembering where it is that he's going to go and why it is that he's come. He's always had this in the forefront of his mind, where he was going and what he was doing. He knew he was going to be sacrificed on a cross. He told his disciples even on the way in, and they still didn't understand what he had to say. So in Zechariah 9, chapter 9, uh, chapter 9, verse 9, says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. And so there was a prophecy said that Jesus would come, the Messiah would come to Jerusalem on the bank, back of a donkey, on the foal of a donkey. And so he did. And the same book speaks of his crucifixion. What are these wounds between your arms, it says in chapter 13. And then he will answer with those in which I was wounded in the house of my friends, referring to his crucifixion. Awake, O sword, come against my shepherd, against the man who is my companion, says the Lord of hosts. Strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. It's an interesting thing that it pleased God to bruise his only son so that you might be saved. I think that's a tremendous act of love and it's one that is worthy of us receiving. So meekness is this thing that we hear in Matthew chapter 5, blessed are the meek, they shall inherit the earth. 
but the meek shall inherit the earth and delight themselves in the abundance of peace is a promise in Psalm 37. In Matthew 11, 29, Jesus calls himself meek. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle, the word there in the Greek is meek, and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So Jesus cries out and asks us to take his yoke upon us, that which uh, we're going to pull along with him, and he invites us to work alongside him, which is a tremendous privilege. And he says that he is gentle and meek, not like the religion of the world that you might think, which imposes all sorts of rules and regulations, but a meekness that comes from a desire to serve. And who wouldn't want to have a God who comes to serve? And he did in the person of his own son, Jesus Christ. So meekness is one of those things that Jesus chose as he comes in on a donkey. Now, there were other modes of transportation that he could have chosen, and he could have come in looking like a hotshot. He could have attracted lots of attention, uh, wearing uh, a cowboy hat. You know, he could have done all sorts of things, but he did not do that. He came in meek. The definition, the best definition I could find of meekness is that meekness doesn't mean weakness. Meekness, rather, is the ability to go without one's deserved importance or influence. That is, meekness is the capacity to be unfairly deprived of either status or acclaim, whether occasioned by adverse circumstances, by being exploited or marginalized, or a specific goal, a pursuit of a just cause. Meekness is the power to be perceived as of little consequence. In short, a meek person does not need to be seen as a big deal or to be the one who seals the deal, even if they actually are the real deal. And Jesus certainly was. But he didn't insist upon it. He didn't insist upon it. He could have made everyone worship him by his own behavior, uh, by, uh, by acclaiming who he was by supernatural means. But he came humble and meek. So meekness is trusting God to vindicate, acclaim, and approve us, not necessarily the opinions of other people. It's not about whether people approve of you. It's whether God approves of you. And that's the first place that we should all be. So moving on with our, our story in verse 33, but as they were loosing the colt, the owners of it said to them, why are you loosing the colt? They said, the Lord has need of him. Uh, I don't know if you, if you would think this, but I would think I'm going to jail. <laughs> Jesus asked me to lift this colt and his mother, and uh, I've just been busted. But Jesus gave them kind of the magic word, what to say. Just tell them the Lord needs it, which sounds like a, an excuse, but the guy bought it, and they actually let them go, which I think is amazing. If you want to find more about the apprehension and the arrest and incarceration of the disciples, you can read through Matthew, gives a little more explanation. But they get away with it, and he lets them go by saying the Lord has need of it. I find it interesting. The Lord has need of a donkey? Do you think the Lord has need of a donkey? I mean, you have to think about that. The God who created everything, he could get anything he wanted at any point in time. Does he need a donkey? I don't know. Does he need a donkey like you? Or does he need a donkey like me? It's interesting because he said, tell them that the Lord has need of the donkey. I think it's interesting. The same Jesus that calmed a storm with a word, he needs something from anyone? Does he need something from me? God's purposes are thwarted because of me? I, I don't think that's the case, do you? Certainly God is sovereign and, and what he chooses to accomplish, he accomplishes. But here, when he spoke to the storm and the storm was completely quiet, it required someone waking him first before he did it. I find that a rather interesting set of circumstances. Jesus slept in the boat, and as they were just about to go under and be capsized, that's when Peter, the mouth of the disciples, decides to wake Jesus, and he wakes him with a rousing, hey, don't you care that we're perishing? <laughs> you know, like, what, what was he thinking? Jesus is in the boat. Jesus stands and he calms the storm. He says, peace, be still. And instantly, the storm was over. And they didn't know who it was that was in the boat with them. They had no, who could this be? Who even the wind and waves obey him. Jesus, who could do that? Do you think he has need of a donkey? I just think it's rather interesting that he would say that. So, this is an interesting statement. I, can do any, I can't do anything without him. I can't do a thing without God being involved. There's nothing that I can do. But he won't do what he can without me. He can't do 
what he would without me. In other words, we each have an indispensable part to be involved in what God's doing. And how that works together, the free will of man and the sovereignty of God is a mystery. But here Jesus says, tell him the Lord has need of this donkey. I don't know about you, but I don't feel like much usually. I don't feel like I'm worth dying for, certainly for the perfect God of heaven to come down into a man's body and do that. But he selected me as he selected you, if you're a child of his, if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, and he says he needs you. And there are things that he needs us to do. Not that he's dependent upon us, but we get to be involved in what God's doing. And who wouldn't want to? When God puts something upon your heart to pray for, it's because something is wanting on God's heart to do. And when we pray about those things, I think we get involved in what God wants to do. It's not us changing God's mind or giving a list to the Santa of heaven saying, give me these things. It's us reacting to his spirits, prompting in our heart to pray about those things that God is already wanting and willing to do. And I think that's what prayer really is. And it's not just a once and done, and it's not in the middle of a calamity alone. It's in the midst of everyday life that God wants to have relationship with us. That's the very reason he created us, was to have relationship. And it's the very reason he saved us, is for relationship. So, I can't do anything without him, but he won't do what he can without me. Which makes me want to say, I want to be obedient to do all those things that he asked me to do. So, step out in faith and dare to do so that he can use you to do what he would love to do. There's no fear in being able to step out and do those things that God asks us to do because there are things behind us moving that God is going to do. So I would encourage each one of you within the hearing of my voice, do something that the Lord's prompting your heart to do. And I don't know about you, but he always has something new for me. There's some new thing that needs to be vanquished in my heart, and there's some new thing that I should do. So, moving on, verse 35, and they brought him to Jesus. They got the donkey and were able to bring him to Jesus, and they threw their own clothes on the colt. And they set Jesus on him, and as he went, they spread their clothes out on the road. So as Jesus is approaching the town, they're laying palm branches, they're laying clothing down. As Jesus comes, the sacrificial lamb of God, uh, they, they, put it, they put the clothes on the animal to keep Jesus separate from the animal, to keep his clothes clean from a dirty animal. But then they also kept the animal itself clean as it went in. Jesus is showing himself to be the Lamb of God, the one who is perfect in every way. And the lambs at this point would be marching into town, the ones that would later be sacrificed during Passover. And so Jesus is that lamb. And he comes at the precise, perfect time. It was prophesied in Daniel chapter 9 that he would come exactly on the 10th of Nisan, April 9th, 32 AD, which is when Jesus rode into Jerusalem. Exactly 173,000 880 days from the edict to rebuild the city of Jerusalem by Artaxerxes of Persia on March 14th, 445 B.C. I had to say that with one breath, sorry. So that's exactly when he said he would come. And it was revealed to Daniel exactly when it would happen, and he did. And Jesus actually holds them to account that they would understand that day. In Daniel chapter 9, it talks about how all of these things are going to happen and how the street will be built even in troublesome times. And you can read that in chapter 9, verses 25 to 27. And they bring Jesus into the town. So, verse 37, Then as he was drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of disciples began to rejoice and to praise God with a loud voice with all, for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. So they start acclaiming him to be the Messiah, to be the one who was going to come and free them from the Romans, or so they thought. And these are, this is one of the Hallel Psalms, which is in Psalm 118, which they sing as they go into Jerusalem during this festival. And it begins with, open to me the gates of righteousness. And you can imagine them singing this as they go into the city of Jerusalem. I will go through them and I will praise the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteousness shall enter. I will praise you for you have answered me and you have become my salvation. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. 
Save now, I pray, O Lord. O Lord, I pray. Send now prosperity. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. God is the Lord, and he has given us light. They're proclaiming Jesus to be the one that was the long-promised Messiah that would come. The very next verse, however, reminds us of what happens a week from now. Bind the sacrifice with cords to the horns of the altar. It's a bit of an ominous transition from all of this praise to God and then the remembrance that Jesus has come to be a sacrifice placed on an altar for the sins of the people of this world, which means you and me. So, in verse 39, some of the Pharisees in the midst of all this called to him from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. Well, why would these men want to stop them from acclaiming? Well, the Pharisees were jealous. It was a power play with them. They were religious rulers. They were the ones who taught the people, and they had the control and the adulation of the people. Jesus was getting worship as the Son of God. And no angel, no person on the face of this planet is due worship except for God alone. And they were recognizing that Jesus was receiving worship that God alone is only worthy of. But Jesus didn't rebuke them. He welcomed it which tells me that Jesus is God, or he wouldn't have accepted worship. He would have shut them down, just like the Pharisees. So whenever you're wondering what's going on in the picture, I always like the Pharisees because they always had their commentary, and then Jesus can respond, and then we all learn, which is why I think they did it. But they're trying to shut him down so he's not worshiped. And he says, well, what kind of stones are going to cry out? So if these folks did not recognize this day of his appearing, the stones would cry out. I find that very interesting. What's, what did Jesus mean by this, and what sort of a rock concert do you think this would be with stones crying out? Well, the Rolling Stones didn't exist yet, so it couldn't have been the Rolling Stones. But Jesus said, if these folks don't cry out, the world itself would, would sing adulation. And uh, it's, it's a way of, of saying that the world itself, the earth, would recognize Jesus and his coming if it wasn't for people. So you don't want to be one of those stones that doesn't acclaim Jesus. You want to be one of those who react so the stones don't have to take your place. In Isaiah chapter 1, verse 3, it says, The ox knows its owner and the donkey its master's crib, but Israel does not know. My people do not consider. It's about the rejection of Jesus the Messiah. It says, He came to his own, but his own did not receive him. But to those who received him and those who believed in his name, he gave the power to become the children of God, even those who believe in his name. So, they recognized Jesus was special in something, but they didn't realize all of it. And then because the creation awaits for redemption, the earth would have cried out in recognition, like it says in Romans chapter 8, verse 19 to 22. The earth would have cried out and acclaimed Jesus. So I want to make sure that I praise Jesus adequately and rightly, because if I don't, then maybe the earth has to make up for what I lack. And sometimes I'm a thankless person. And sometimes I don't worship God as I should, and I, it's a reminder to me that I should recognize Jesus for who he is, and I should never lose my heart of thankfulness toward him. So uh, Matthew 21, uh, verses 1 to 11, here in verse 10, it says, And when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And so the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. So you see, they didn't even know who was with him. They saw Jesus and thought he was a prophet, at least the multitudes do. I'm always uh, keen on when it says multitudes instead of his particular disciples because they always had a misunderstanding of who Jesus was. And he came on the perfect day in the perfect way as a king, but he showed meekness. Now, he could have come another day on a different way without a lowly heart in a way that you might think like a king, like a king of this world, but he didn't. But I can tell you, Jesus is coming again, and he won't be coming as a meek servant to sacrifice again. He'll be coming as a reigning monarch, and he will expect every knee to bow and every tongue to confess that Jesus is the Lord. So I want to do it on this side of eternity as opposed to the other side. It says here in verse 41, Now as he drew near, he saw the city, and he wept over it. Jesus, as he was approaching the city of Jerusalem, 
wept. And by the way, this word wept doesn't mean uh, like he wept for um, Lazarus. It says that he wept, the shortest verse in the Bible. That's a completely different word than this word here. This word means he wept convulsively, uncontrollably. The weeping that he did for um, Lazarus when he knew that Lazarus would come back, he knew he was going to raise him from the dead. It's, it's interpreted as he groans a little bit earlier. It's the very same word that he uses. Jesus was discouraged at the lack of faith. What he told them he was going to do, they did not believe. Here, Jesus convulsively wept for the city of Jerusalem and the people that would not receive him. Not because he wasn't received and he wasn't liked, but because of what that would mean for Jerusalem. So he saw the city and wept over it, saying, If you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace, but they are hidden from your eyes. Jesus approaching there wept for the people that would not see him. You know, it's easy for me to get angry with people who don't believe in Jesus. It's easy for me to grow uh, unhappy with the strivings of our government. It's, it's easy for me to get frustrated with that. But when I think that there are people that will spend eternity separated from God because of their rejection of him, I don't know how you can't have compassion. I don't know how you can't show forgiveness when you begin to think like Jesus did. And I think if you did, you would weep like Jesus does. For those who are lost and have hardened hearts, we need to pray for them and we need to share the truth with them and we need to love them, even as Jesus did, even though he was rejected. And he said, even though now it is hidden from your eyes. And he says here, he prophesies in verse 43, for the days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you, and close you in on every side, speaking of Jerusalem in 70 AD, and level you and your children within you to the ground. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. Jesus explains to us exactly what happens in 70 AD and why. Because they did not recognize the Messiah who came to them. And the city was destroyed 70 AD by Titus Vespasian. And the Romans, they came in and they ransacked Jerusalem. 1.3 million Jews died defending Jerusalem that day or that time. And somebody actually accidentally set fire to the temple area and it caught fire and all of the gold in the temple melted between the stones and so all of the Roman uh, soldiers that were there to overturn the stones to get to the gold and there truly was not one stone left upon another just as Jesus said and he said it happened because you did not recognize the day of your visitation not for any other reason and so what you're left with is the relic you're with a very large Muslim uh, population as, long, as well as Jewish and Christian sharing the great city of Jerusalem and basically just the antiquity of relics to look and to remember and to remember the hope uh, of a Messiah coming. But the Messiah has already come. He'll come again, but as a, as a, a reigning Lord. In verse 45, it says, So he went into the temple... And he began to drive out those who bought and sold in it, saying to them, It is written, My house is a house of prayer, but you have made it into a den of thieves. Jesus, in coming, weeps over the city. (coughs) Excuse me. (coughs) But he also cleans the temple out, clears it out of all of the debauchery that was happening. They were selling animals for exorbitant prices for sacrifice. They were exchanging money for incredible amounts of interest. And everybody was in collusion, and they turned it into a giant festival. And they turned it into a big money-making scheme. And it wasn't worship of God at all. It was the worship of money. It was just like idolatry in the courts of the Gentiles, where it was the only place, if you were a Gentile, wanted to draw near to God. It's the closest you'll ever get to the presence of God. It's the closest that you would ever be. And it was contaminated by such a bad example, where the Jews were to be this great example of what it was Uh, for a people to be reverent, to be given over to the purposes of God. Here they were being an example of of absolute greed and gluttony. And so Jesus, overcome with this zeal for his father's house, clears it out of the animals and the doves and overturns money changers uh, tables and he cleans it all out so that worship could be conducted in the house of God as it should. Every once in a while I think God does that with me. Does he do that with you? Does he come into the temple of your 
life and show you that there are things that shouldn't be happening, where your priorities are wrong, where there's the worship of something, where something's out of priority. It's something that uh, he does to me on a periodic basis, and I realize that I fall short of being who God wants me to be. And he comes in and he cleans my temple out, and I hope he does you as well. We should welcome him instead of fighting with him, and we should uh, allow him to straighten it out so we can be more properly the house of God. In verse 47, and he was teaching daily in the temple, but the chief priests, the scribes, and the leaders of the people sought to destroy him. He had two different receptions. One was from the religious elite who wanted nothing to do with Jesus because they wanted the control. They wanted the power. They wanted to be able to buy and sell animals and to make all of this money. And then there were the people who were hungry to know God. And the question is, which group do you fall into? Do you fall into somebody who, you know, pretends, you know, do you, do you go to church on a Sunday and just, just to say that you did it or, or to do good things and try to be acceptable to God? Or are you really hungry to know more of what God wants you to do in your life? Like, Lord, what would you have me do? And that's really where we should be, is to have a hunger to do what he would have us do. So we see on this Palm Sunday, there's a preparation. Jesus had a preparation and and joined some disciples to go do some risky work, and they stepped out to do it. Are you willing to do the preparation for Christ to come to you? and into your heart in a deeper way. And we see that there's a reception where he's received with glad uh, accolades and and praise to God. And sometimes we can do the same thing. And yet, when it comes down for us to actually do those things that God would have us do, it becomes difficult, doesn't it? And so we can be very much like Palm Sunday when Jesus tells us to do something, and then very much like... uh, the time when he's crucified on Good Friday, when we don't want anything to do with what Jesus tells us to do. And then, of course, there's the reaction that Jesus has to all of this, where he weeps over broken hearts, and he comes in and he cleans out the temple. And I think there are times when when God is disappointed with me, when I'm not in a place where I should be, and I'm doing the things that I should be doing, and I know that I can do better, but I know with God's help that I will. And I want to be a temple that is ready for him to worship and to, to um, just occupy all of me. And I hope you're the same way. That the Lord would occupy all of you and that as we approach the time of the resurrection, as we look forward to Easter coming, as it's called, that you might be more prepared and ready for God to come and make his home inside of you. So I pray that the Lord bless you guys and strengthen you in this time, and that this might be an encouragement as you hear the word of God. Amen.